Hello, everyone, and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of History and the 21st Annual African American Cultural Celebration. Our presenter, Harvey Walker, will begin in just a moment, but we want to start with a few notes. Please remember to ask questions in the chat, and we'll do our best to respond to them and share with our presenter. Please note that our presenters and off-camera crew are masked for the safety of everyone. We would like to thank the following sponsors of the North Carolina Museum of History Foundation who have helped to make this event possible. Hello, and welcome to the 21st annual African American Cultural Celebration at the North Carolina Museum of History. I'm your host, Earl Imes, your farmer and historian, curator of African American and agricultural history at the North Carolina Museum of History. This year's theme is environmental justice, black people, green planet. And we are fortunate to have as a presenter in this year's event, Mr. Harvey Walker. Mr. Harvey Walker was one of the first student athletes to integrate colleges in North Carolina as a high recruited football player out of Maryland at Western Carolina University in 1969. Mr. Walker is currently serving on the town council of Moorhead City, North Carolina and helping that community and region and its growth and development. Mr. Harvey Walker, thank you and welcome to the event. And I must say that when I share news with people inside and outside of our committee that we were going to have Harvey Walker, there was a lot of applause that said, you're going to have the Harvey Walker? I said, yes, we're going to have the Harvey Walker on our program. So again, thank you, Harvey Walker, and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of History. Thank you, Earl. Well, good. Well, I want to take an opportunity to kind of get into our presentation uh, by first asking you a little bit about your background and who you are, your family, and uh, kind of what started you off uh, as a young person and what were some of your expectations uh, growing up. Okay. So you, when you were uh, growing up, I think you you were in Baltimore, Maryland. Is that right? Yes, I was. And so uh, you mentioned that um, as a child growing up there, that your mother and and tell me your mother's name again, please. Richella Tillery Walker. R Richella Tillery Walker, who was born in Moorhead City. Yes. And she was an educator. Yes. And your father, Harvey Walker Sr., yes. uh, was a fisherman, yes. as well as a soldier during World War II who helped, among other things, to build the world-famous Alaskan Highway in 1941. Yes. So coming out of that, you had a level of expectation that you were always going to go to college. Yes. So with that, the, the idea is planted not only in your mother, but your grandmother. Can you uh, tell me about her and who she was? My grandmother was Nora Walker out of Northumberland County. She taught pretty much at that period of time, almost all of the African-American kids that came through there. She taught eight grades in one classroom, which was pretty unique. She had tables for each year one table for the first grade, another table for the second, and so on and so forth. She graduated from Virginia Union back in the day. So she was very, very much so an educator. Well, good. And you see on the screen here, uh, there's a picture of your father's uh, engineering unit. Uh, and you can see where I have him pictured there on the right side and a little bit about him. But that 
again, was a uh, very monumental achievement and kind of indicative to the level of expectation that was conveyed to you uh, growing up. Yes. And so here's a picture that we see on the screen of your grandmother uh, from about 1920. And I know Miss Nora Tigner Walker. Yes, that's her. Right. And she was an educator in Burgess, Virginia. And you told me she taught eight grades in a one room school during the 1920s. That was true. That is really amazing. That is amazing. So as a youth in junior high school, you shared with me that you were labeled, quote, <laughs> as at risk. Uh, and yet, when they tested you uh, for what they called IQ intelligence quotient back then, that you scored the highest IQ in your junior high school. That's the trick. Right. So uh, you shared with me a quote from an educator at your junior high school, Dr. Ann Emery, who says that uh, Harvey wanted to be a hoolum, <laughs> but I just wouldn't let him. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, was a fine lady. She was the person who really redirected my my skills and talents at that time she had put me in a private school mount st joseph college in in maryland and uh, she made that statement when she found out that i had made Mel mayor pro tem in the city of Mo moorhead and she used me as an example for the kids that she was currently ass assisting and wanted to let them know and that's the point that she made she had that on a powerpoint and the article that announced my uh, being made mayor pro tem, she blew it up on a PowerPoint. And then that was a statement she made to her young kids to let them know that they too could make a change in their life. Well, that is wonderful. And that's certainly motivation uh, when an educator puts you on the spot like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so when it came time for you to graduate, there was no question at all that you were going to go to college. You were an outstanding uh, student and uh, by all measure, one of the top uh, football players in the state of Maryland uh, during the uh, middle, uh, late 1960s. And uh, you shared with me that you played quarterback. And, uh, and with that being the top position on the field, logically drew a lot of attention from scouts. Uh, and yet you said your mother had the final say or a lot of influence, shall we say, on where you attended university. Could yes. you expound on how you wound up at Western Carolina? Well, initially, I grew up in a neighborhood where a lot of Baltimore Colts and Baltimore Orioles, who were professional teams, lived. Lenny Moore and Donnie Michi and Gino Marchetti lived across the alley from where I lived, and Frank Robinson lived around the corner. I learned how to play football by playing with Lenny Moore. Okay. Wow, with the old Baltimore Colts. Yes. Wow, now what a what a tremendous So he would take us out and play. I was recruited to go to Louisville. And when I got there, my person who was supposed to be my I guess you could say show me around was Wes Unsell at that time. Wow, the NBA and, Hall of Famer. And uh, we got there on that Friday, and my parents didn't see me no more until that Sunday. And they, when I came back, they said, you will not be going to this school. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother graduated from Livingstone College. In Salisbury, North Carolina. In Salisbury, North Carolina. She wanted me to attend Livingstone. At that time, they didn't have money to give me a scholarship. So my coach, Gene Niebelin, who was a coach at Mount St. Joe, sent my films and things up to Western Carolina and Appalachian and a few other schools. Well, my first trip was to Western Carolina. Well, I came up there after they saw me run the 40. They offered me a scholarship that day. What did you run the 40 in? I ran a 40 around a 4-4-4-5. Four, 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 a 4 four, four. Now, that is unheard of even... I mean, that's elite speed today. Yeah. But, yes. And uh, at that time, I loved to ride horses. And uh, it was a coach up there who had horses. And I, they put me on a horse, and I signed that same day. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, so you get to Western Carolina, 
and you had been a standout star quarterback in Maryland. And yet, when you get on campus, they put you on the other side of the ball on defense, which is interestingly a standard modus operandi for integration of college football and football in general back in the 60s and 70s. Tell me a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, when I, I came back from when I came to Western, I came as a as a quarterback, but as a running back. And the coach from another school, a guy from Asheville, who eventually a, his he he ended up bringing his running back to Western, which then made it so that I wasn't able to be at that position. I had to play second string at that point because this guy was pretty good anyway. But he also brought his coach with him from Asheville. So at that time, the coach moved me to defense to play defensive corner, which I ended up doing okay with that position. Okay, I will say a little bit better than okay, Harvey. You being modest now, you actually won as a freshman defensive player of the year for an award that they created just for you that year? Yeah, big, yeah, big play award. Big play defensive player of the year. And here's a image of the trophy uh, as a freshman defensive back. You won the award created just uh, for you. So that is an interesting uh, accomplishment, a very big accomplishment, especially for a freshman coming in college and then switching complete new position. That's, that says a lot. Well, I set a record that year that still holds to this day. Well, you know, I, I hear you because, uh, you know, I, we've had a lot of conversations. And one of the things you keep telling me that I was Deion Sanders before, <laughs> that was a Deion Sanders. <laughs> and when I look back in the records and the record book, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I mean, how, how is it that in 2022 and 2021, we're finding out just about the prowess on the field of a Harvey Walker, someone who was Deion Sanders before Deion Sanders was prime time. And this is an image of you on the screen where the, uh, I guess the famous number 22 is almost a sense of foreshadowing. So when, um, when you switched over to the defensive side of the ball, uh, it was like lightning out of a bottle. And uh, I had an opportunity to interview one of your former coaches. In fact, the only one who's still alive today, uh, Mr. Don Denning, he lives out in Georgia now. And we had a wonderful conversation and he shared so many compliments about you and was thankful for what you had done for university and for college sports in general and how well-deserved the honor was for you uh, to be uh, in installed into their Hall of Fame. But you see on the screen there, it said, uh, this was a quote that he shared with me in the phone interview. Wow. I mean, that's how he said it. Harvey Walker, wow, synonymous. Harvey could cover anybody in college sports, man to man, anybody. And then we would drop in a three, dome, three deep zone defense which means that you had to cover a part of the field. But very rarely is someone responsible for covering half or one third of the field. And he said that you could do it with ease and even go over to the other side of the field and help the other safeties or corners if need be. And he says, he goes on and says that he later coached at Clemson University, which is synonymous for football and college sports, and Memphis, and that he sent 12 cornerbacks or defensive backs to the pros and that you were the best by far of all of them and so i thought that was a tremendous compliment but uh you see on the screen there's a photograph of you and probably one of your 22 interceptions wow is that one that went back to the house harvey i think it did <laughs> all right i hear you i hear you that's a wonderful picture and that and that can you tell me a little bit about that actual picture though, Harvey? That picture was was made, uh, was put on the cover of the program for the 1977 season. Uh, Coach Waters wanted to make sure 
that that was put on the cover for some things that didn't happen in 1976. Well, good, kind of uh, kind of a little makeup ball, we kind of say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's an outstanding shot. I mean, action shot, and you can tell that 4-4 four, four speed on display. <laughs> you can see it there. So, you know, you play 1969 and 70 season, and then the 1970-71 season at Western Carolina, and then there was a drop-off, and you left and went to uh, the United States Air Force. Yes. And I'm saying to myself, wow, how in the world does a quarter, a cornerback, a defensive back of that skill level make a decision to go and serve his country? I mean, it sounds like the Pat Tillman type of stuff from the NFL where you just quit at the prime, you quit at the height of your uh, ability and you go serve your country at that time in Vietnam, which was no small order. And so when me, I met with you in, at your home in Moorhead City and you shared with me uh, a picture. If you see on the screen, there's a photograph of the helmet there, but if we can pan, I have a picture of your unit in 1972, which uh, shows you in the United States Air Force and you were sharing some very interesting stories about your uh, tour of duty in the Vietnam War in the United States Air Force. Can you share some of that uh, with us? Well, I, we played, uh, I was stationed in Arizona, Davis Martin Air Force Base, and we uh, had won the base championship and inter service championship three times in a row. When I had my orders to go to Vietnam, I was interrupted on the way to, to Vietnam in the Philippines. Um, I'm sitting on the plane and the guy comes on, calls for Sergeant Walker to, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean this little language up because in the military they use other language. <laughs> <laughs> but I was asked to leave the aircraft. <laughs> grab my bag and leave the aircraft. So when the, when I got there, they took me to the base commander's office. And he told me that Colonel Buckles said that I could play a little football. Colonel Buckles was my base commander in Arizona. So they had a, they had a football playoff for the rest of, I guess, the next three weeks. And they had me stay there and play with them. After that, I had to leave and go on into, into Vietnam, into Thailand. Okay, so let me back up because we got a little bit ahead of ourselves about that and that. Uh, but during this time frame, as a full time college student on scholarship, weren't weren't you exempt from draft? You you weren't drafted, were you? No, I um, I had decided to uh, take two years off. We had an incident on day on campus that uh, allowed me to take the two years or to, to en enroll into the service rather than have a uh, rather, I guess to say the best way to do it, there was an incident that was wrongly presented. And rather than cause a problem, I decided to go ahead and, and enlist in the service. Um, while in the service, I was asked to come back because the incident that happened was they basically misconstrued. So I was asked to come back to continue on with my education. Well, see, Harvey, that's one reason why I admire you so much because you're very modest. And out of that modesty, you know, you share with me that you have been wrongfully accused of something uh, that you knew who you knew the person was who actually had committed these offenses. But yet from your background, and as you say, from your street credibility, you're not a snitch and you're not going to rat anybody out, no matter how wrong it is, even if that means uh, you uh, paying what was perceived at that time a price 
where instead of you, in essence, uh, snitching, let the powers that be do the investigations and find out. But in the meantime, you can't stand around and be accused. Your life goes on and you make a choice which turns out to be even better for you and certainly for our country. Thank you for your service. Uh, where uh, things are ironed out. In the meantime, you take things to a higher level of consciousness. So as it turns out, your decision, though I'm sure you as a 20, 21 year old at the time didn't think it may have been in long term, appears to have worked out in your favor because when they invite you, when Western Carolina University resolves the issue and asks you to return, uh, what were your emotions like then? And what did you think? I mean, we're talking about, and, and you know, people today, when we look at college football, don't really know or sometimes can't appreciate the rough transition it was to integrate uh, not only college, college athletic sports, and you also on another layer were in process of establishing the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Uh, chapter there at Western Carolina. So I know there's a mouthful, but kind of expound on that too. Well, you were right. Um, it's correct. I was I was raised in a, you know in a neighborhood where you didn't, you know, you man up for what you do. And rather than be a person who would be a snitch or whatever, I proceeded to let the system work its way out. When I came back, they had found out who the, who the real culprit was, and we moved beyond that. I then moved on to try to establish a black fraternity, which was Alpha Phi Alpha, and that turned out to be a very positive thing. Um, I'm assuming that here, here and where you're going, I think I'll go ahead and, and move a little further into this conversation by telling you that in the 1975 season, when I did return, we had some problems. When we had some, we had some racial problems. Uh, during that time, I noticed that we had uh, some of the African American men had been basically unfair to each other, and I couldn't understand why. I heard one of them say to each other, I hope that you get hurt. Well, what was happening, they were stacking people behind each other. The African-American guys had to play in one position. So I proceeded to take it to the coach to ask them, could they give them another opportunity to try out for other positions? Well, that didn't go over too well, okay? And the coach is Bob Waters, the head coach is Bob Waters at this time? Yes, it was. He was the head coach, but I did not speak to him about it. Okay. Okay. I spoke to one of his assistants. Bob Waters was probably one of my biggest advocates. I mean, he was the one who made me return. So he was one of my biggest supporters. So the coach that I spoke to was one of his assistants. And his comment to me was, Harvey, why are you worried about it? You are, you and your own. You got your position, so you don't need to worry about it. Well, in 75, they had us write a, uh, a letter. In other words, they asked you, because the season was so bad, they wanted us to say, give your opinion of what you thought the season was. Don't put your position. Don't put your name. No, I'm sorry, don't put your name. Just put your position and your classification. Well, being an older gentleman, I knew how that would work. So I just wrote a two page, I mean, a two sentence doc document. Um, I then was given a, how can I say it? I was, be, I was, I was then treated kind of strange, okay? I was put in the basement of the of the dorm. I did not understand why. As you noticed, and you've already done your research, 
1976, I was not uh, treated very well. Um, you asked why it has taken so long for me to be recognized. Well, I've, upon speaking to one of the people up there at campus, they told me just recently that it was because of an editorial or a letter that was written or, a, or some article that was written by a Mr. Rob Neufeld a few years ago. The Western North Carolina historian. He was a Western North Carolina historian. He was the one that called me one day. I didn't know who he was. And he reminded me that, or not reminded me, he informed me that we finished number two in the nation. He wanted to know if I was that guy with that Harvey Walker that played on the team that finished number two in the nation. At that time, I knew nothing about that. Right, and, and, yeah, and just to remind our audience, this is before the internet, this is before many people even had televisions, and you would rely on newspapers uh, to get this type of information about college rankings and, and who's an All-American and so forth and so on. Exactly. Yes. So he told us that we had finished number two in the nation. He told me that I had finished number four in the nation individually and that we held the team to seven yards passing. Unheard of. Okay. I knew none of this. You mean, now stop right there. You mean that for that season that the opposing team averaged only seven yards per game passing? No, no, no. The last game. The last game. Okay. last game. The last game you held them to seven yards. Right. It, just amazing in and of itself. Okay. I think the record was that year we held them to less than 62 yards or 56 yards, something like that. It was it was it was it was incredible. It was the second best effort of a secondary in the country. In the history of college football up to that time. Right. Yes. That's why that's why he called because he thought it was so unusual for a, a team up in western North Carolina to be able to to perform that way. Um at that time I had no idea that I had had a, had records that strong at Western because my senior year I didn't get any print at all I mean so at the end of the year you mean no trophy I had the trophy that you just saw was the only thing I ever got there from your freshman year 1969 that's the only trophy that you have right so far right okay okay all right so at that time um once he he notified me of all this I was trying to inquire about it. Um, I was pretty much, you know, shocked that we had those kind of records. Um, so once he, once we we were trying to pursue it, it just died on the vine. You know, we would go in, and just nobody would do anything. He wrote three articles, which were pretty good. And this is articles in the Asheville Citizen Times yes. newspaper? Yes. yes. And all he did in the articles basically was tell what happened or tell, you know, the facts. Right. It was, hasn't been up until this year, basically, that I knew that I had performed at such a level in the last couple of years that I had performed at such a level that uh, was kind of revealing. So, so you knew you were good. Uh, the opposing teams knew you were the best out there. The Western Carolina Catamounts football program knew you were the best, but no one had any stats to share with you that you had this number of, of interceptions that game or that season or this number of deflections or tackles. No, the stats were there. The stats have always been there. Right now, given today, my stats, I have more records right now today after almost 50 years than people who have been selected at my position individually or collectively in the Hall of Fame or the 20th century teams that they have now. Yes. So uh, what you see on the screen is is what I call an artifact now, and I think uh, you fortunate enough to let us share it in person here. This is your original uh, helmet from the 1976 season, is that right? Yes. 
Good. Yeah, and, and still uh, looks like you wore it just this past season. Uh, but that is a, a real treasure and an artifact. Thank you for sharing that. I think, uh, among other things, the story uh, of being able to encourage uh, your story more than anything is kind of a pattern to, that can encourage many student athletes who are going to be going in the future to these colleges and universities of remote areas can learn a lot from you. But, you know, when you return to Western Carolina on full scholarship and you picked up on big play defense, what you see on the right is the, the program that we were able to dig up from Western Carolina, uh, where you were an award winner and uh, you have been moved from cornerback to safety, or in other words, the captain of the defense. But I thought it was interesting, you know, how they arrayed everyone on the, on the, on the, in the book. And with you being literally the best person on the team, I thought you would be captain and maybe spotlighted in the middle. Uh, but uh, these are uh, some of your teammates. So, do you yeah, the, the one up on the left, Daryl. It's probably the greatest running back that we've ever had there. I mean, he's 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 really good. Mike Wade was a linebacker. He played with us in that '76 year. He was a, he was great. Terry Moore, the gentleman in the middle, was the left corner of that year. And Joe on the left, bottom left, he was a lineman, and he played offensive line. And then Wayne Tolson on the right was a, a nice receiver. And I'm here at the bottom. And uh, that was the year that I finished number four in the nation and led the secondary to being ranked number two in the nation. And that's and, a nice afro too. <laughs> yes, it is. I like that afro. Well, good. The So second ranked defense in the nation, uh, Rob Newfield digs this research up, publishes it in the Asheville Citizen Times because it was interesting. Himself, he could not get the true story of how good that Western Carolina University football team was during that time frame, and in particular you, because of the misinformation or lack of information going to the Asheville Citizen Times, but he was able to look in other newspapers like those in Silva, North Carolina, or in Marion and Hendersonville and some of these other smaller towns who would take their reporters to your game and they would freelance report your greatness. And so he was able to reconstitute a lot of the information from those other newspapers. Uh, and so with that, that kind of led in a lot of motion toward your nomination and eventual election into the Western Carolina University Hall of Fame. And so I know you uh, called me, you mentioned this past November about the homecoming and that it was actually, it was a football victory. And you see on the screen is a photograph of you tailgating there, right? Uh, with some of your uh, classmates and alumni. Um, but Tell me a little bit more about that weekend and how you were feeling uh, when it came time uh, for the actual induction into the uh, Sports Hall of Fame. Well, you know, my, my, my tenure at Western Carolina University was a good one. When I say that, I met some very good friends. You don't judge a university for the, the acts of a few. Um, but the university is a great school. I mean, I had a very good time there. Still have some good friends there. Um, when I went back up there, it was a very touching moment to go into the Hall of Fame. Um, you, you see these big blow-ups that's behind me over here, this one on this side. My fraternity came to, rep you know, to, to come and support me. Alpha Phi Alpha? Alpha Phi Alpha had representation. Um, a couple of guys that I played with back in 69 came back, Don Dalton, Steve Spradlin. They came back to support me, Mike Mabry. Um, so it was a very, very good time for me at the school. The some of the some of the, I guess you could say some of the times or some of the things I went through was pretty interesting. Uh, it was a definitely interesting time, you know. I think I told you about when they left me for a football game, you know. 
you know, I was put in the basement, you know, of the, of the dorm. So when they went to come get everybody to go to the game, they forgot to come get me. So they had to bring a ball, bring a car back to get me because they, they had left me. Can't play, you can't play without Harvey Walker, that's for sure. I mean, you got to have your shut down corner. And, you know, so everybody who can return kickoffs and punt returns and do all those things, you got to have him, right? Oh, I, yeah, you know, I laugh at some of those things now because that was, that was pretty interesting. I mean, you know, um, I had to endure a lot. And I usually tell people sometimes you, you know, don't let tough times stop you from what you've got to do. You know, Western taught me a lot when I say that. You know, when they made me run in 19 degree weather and, and, you know, give me 75 laps and all these kinds of things. At the time, I didn't know that they were really preparing me for life later on. Um, it really made me build character, you know, to know that you can go through something once you set a goal, you don't let something stop you. They thought they were gonna stop me, I guess. But that, you know, my life was supposed to be something else. As I was explaining to some people, they want to say, well, you know, Harvey, you could have played pro ball. Well, I told them this. If God wanted me to play pro ball, I'd be playing pro ball, okay? So I don't give them that kind of credit. But I can say this, that at Western Carolina, I outplayed everybody that played pro ball there. As a testament from your uh, coach, uh, former coach, Don Denning, who... Okay. When I mention your name, the first thing out of his mouth is, wow. Okay. Now, I've never seen anybody on football feel like Harvey Walker. And so that that's something. I mean, I'm looking at your your 22 interceptions, Harvey. That's unheard of. I mean, and, uh, you know, we, we're in our talks and conversations, we talk about how Deion Sanders, I think, has 23 interceptions. No, Deion had 14. 14 interceptions, okay. He had 14 interceptions, I believe. He had three touchdowns and 250 yards of his college career. That's what I, I, I think is close. But that's nowhere close to your 22 interceptions. Right. I had. I think I had, uh, yeah, I had four interceptions for touchdowns and, you know, four, yeah, 22 interceptions. Four for touchdowns. Right. And you told me about maybe with the photograph that we saw was a 75 yard uh, pick six. Yes. Oh, wow, boy. I bet you brought the house down on that one. Oh, yeah. That was my first. <laughs> I did that one my first. I told the guys in Vietnam that the first time I take the ball back, I was going to spike it for them because I played over in the Nam and we played together. So the first time I took the ball back was against Appalachia. I had set them up on a swing pass, and they decided to try to get in the second quarter. <laughs> <laughs> it was too late that time. It was it was six, you know, the other way. A swing pass in the flat. That is just on Harvey Walker. Are you serious? They tried it twice. <laughs> and I mean, nine intercept, well, four, nine interceptions in one season. Yes. Nine interceptions. I mean, that back then there were only nine games, wasn't it? We're, right. We we that was the record that still holds to this day. So you're talking about an interception per game. Yes. I've done, my record will tell you this. I have uh, 22 interceptions, seven touchdowns, and 400, and I think 470, 480 yards. Of return yardage after picks. Unheard of. Right. I've, Unheard of. I have a kickoff return, punt return. The only time I played offense, I caught a touchdown. And then uh, the rest were... Just, just Harvey, big playmaker. That's yeah. all. Just, just make big plays. They don't even test you at some point. I, I would imagine. I mean, and you, 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 we talk about you anchored the second best defense in the NCAA in 1976. Uh, you know, one of the founders of Alpha Phi Alpha at Western Carolina University. Uh, you established the Harvey Walker Scholarship at Western Carolina in uh, 2000, and I'm sure there are a lot of grateful uh, students uh, for that. And then finally, coming full circle to reconcile your induction into the Western Carolina uh, Football and Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, congratulations, congratulations. Well, thank you. And, uh, and, and thank you again for your service and your dedication and your 
uh, absolute uh, role model for so many people who can look at how to uh, attack per and persevere through uh, adversity. And, and so, you know, well-deserved uh, honor in, in the Western Carolina Football uh, Hall of Fame. So, you know, today you moved back to Moorhead City. Uh, you've been recently reelected as a city councilman, city council person. And, uh, you know, you're instrumental in the development and the planning of the Crystal Coast and Moorhead City. And at the same time, balancing the interests of the long term residents there. Uh, because, as we know, here in North Carolina, we're a destination place. People want to come here from all over the world. But even us here in North Carolina, we love to go to Moorhead City and to the beach. And I can imagine the, uh, the struggle that you have, you know, balancing that development and maintaining the interests of the longtime residents. Can you speak a little bit to that? Well, Moorhead City is my home. It's a beautiful place. And I would encourage anybody and everybody Come on down, you will enjoy it. It's probably, we call it a hidden paradise. It's a beautiful place. We've got wonderful people. Um, I would encourage you to come. As I say, it's the best place on the East Coast. One of the best places in the world and some of the best seafood. Uh, best in, best in place, best, best seafood on the East Coast. Yes, yes. Our beaches face south, which makes it better. You get to see a sunrise and a sunset on the crystal coast there and and so uh, i would encourage anyone if you want to come to the beach come to moorhead city crystal coast and you you won't go to any other beach after you've been there <laughs> i hear you well well harvey thank you so much how can people uh reach you in moorhead city in the crystal coast uh i can give you my email address it's harvey walker 06 at gmail and my phone number is 252-622-2665. Please give me a call if you need any assistance, but come on down and enjoy yourself. Well, Harvey, I know you're a popular man, but uh, you pro you're about to be more popular giving your number out. <laughs> and I think people are gonna enjoy uh, talking to you and learning from you, and they will especially enjoy going to see and visit you in Moorhead City on the Crystal Coast. So again, thank you for everything that you are doing today, will do, and certainly what you have done in history and service for our country and for our community. Thank you, Harvey Walker, Jr. Thank you for having me. Yes, and again, uh, this is Earl Imes, your host for the History, Film, and Enterprise Forum of the African American Cultural Celebration, the 21st annual event. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all so much again for joining us for our presentation with Mr. Um, Harvey Walker. And be sure to um, watch some live performances taking place throughout our day. And they're screening on our website, nc aacc.com and thank you again for joining us for the 21st annual african-american cultural celebration which continues until five o'clock today thank you all <laughs>